Christmas, a season of expectations, the perfectly hosted party, the flawless Christmas tree, brightest lights, the nicest decorations, the perfect presents. Every year we eagerly await, and every year when it's all said and done, we often feel like something is missing. Could we be expectant towards the wrong things? Could they distract us from the true meaning of Christmas? We have been talking the last three weeks about a sermon series called Expectant. We expect certain things when it comes to Christmas time. But have you ever expected something and received something else instead? Have you ever had these expectations and been disappointed on something that you've received? See, this morning I want to talk to you about a, a story where we pursue some things expecting for a certain outcome. And God gives us something else instead. When I was 30 years old, it was my 30th birthday. I know I don't look 30, you know, but uh, I'm, I'm beyond that in years now. And 30 years old, went to California for my birthday, took the family to Las Vegas, never been there before. And I lost something very, very important. I was expecting a certain situation to take place. It was late at night put my kids into bed it was we were in a, a hotel room and you know it's it's amazing that the hotel doors in Vegas don't have locks you know you know the deadbolt lock that you put the deadbolt and then the little click you know the the little chain and and it gets stuck as you open the door they didn't have those in this hotel room it just simply was locked from the inside but you could open it from the inside to the outside and about 4 o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call to the room, wake up, answer it, and somebody says, are you missing a child? Now, immediately I say, you know, no, I'm not missing any children, and I have all my kids, and they actually described it as, are you missing a dark child? And I'm thinking, no, that, that can't be me, you know, not realizing that, yes, my skin is brown and I have dark children. And, you know, it's 4 in the morning, you're trying to wake up, and and I started to count my kids. One, two, three, uh-oh. Where's number four? And sure enough, my daughter at three years old had woken up in the middle of the night and had wandered out. Had She had opened the door from the inside and had wandered down the hallway. And I think she was probably uh, sleepwalking like she often did at the house. She would wake up from her bed and she'd walk down a long hallway and climb into ours. And she laid down in front of the elevators at a hotel casino and fell asleep. Now praise God that the security guards were, were good at doing their job. And they had identified which room that she had come out of. They had grabbed her and secured her. I can only imagine what would have happened if she would have ended up going down the elevator to the casino. And she would have just been gone. But they identified what room she came out of. They contacted us. She was fine. And she got a whole little bear out of the ordeal. Uh, from the security guard, so it worked out okay. But I was expecting for my kids to be asleep. I was expecting for them to be safe. And things didn't work out the way that I had expected. You see, in this story, I want you to open up your Bibles this morning to Luke 15. And a lot of you have probably heard this story once or twice in your upbringing in church. It's a very common story but I think it speaks of volumes today of people who were expecting a certain outcome and it went very different than what they thought it would. Luke 15, Jesus is talking about three different stories, three different parables. He talks about a lost sheep, a lost koi, and a lost son. We're going to be studying Luke 15, chapter or verses 11, talking about the lost son, but it's amazing how Jesus is so concerned about things that are lost. And in our expectations, we can actually lose the meaning 
of Christmas. In our expectations, we can get distracted, as Eric talked about last week. And this week, I want to talk to you about what is it that we often pursue with our expectations. And in our pursuits, we can sometimes get lost of what the true meaning really is. It starts out with Luke 15, verse 11. And I'm going to ask for you to raise your hands if you need a Bible. They're passing them out in there. By the way, this is our, our Christmas message here at The Source, but we don't want to leave you stranded as well. If you, on Christmas morning, want to tune in online, we're going to have an online experience on Christmas Day. So you can go to Facebook and click on that online experience, and we're going to talk all about Christmas with four different pastors in the room around a roundtable discussion of what Christmas is really about. I hope we don't ruin your Christmas story for you, but I have to tell you there's some things in there that will blow your mind of what you expected Christmas, the story, to really portray as we've seen these plays over and over again. And we talk about the reality of what Christmas really is. And so what it was like for them back then with Jesus' time and in his day and it's going to be good. So if you want to tune in on Christmas morning, we're going to have that for you on Facebook. But here, I'm going to start with Luke 15, verse 11. And it says, Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now I can just imagine... Already, the son's expectation. Because for him to go to his father and for him to say, give me my share of the estate. What he's asking for is his inheritance ahead of time. He's saying, listen, dad, what you have planned to give to me, because often when the father would die, he would pass down his inheritance, everything that he collected. The oldest son would get double the portion. That's why you see in the Old Testament that Jacob was actually trying to buy Esau's birthright because he wanted to buy his double portion. They would get a double portion of the inheritance. That was what the culture taught. And then the younger son would get half of that, and it would just go from there. And the younger son goes and already says, Dad, give me my inheritance. I want it now. What he's pretty much saying is, Dad, I wish you were dead. Everything that you've offered to me living in your house, everything that you've given to me living here, I, I have what I want out there and I'm going to pursue it and just, just give it to me now and let me take it so I can go live my own life. I no longer want to live under your rules. I no longer want to live under your regulations. I want to no longer live with you. It's like you're already dead to me. Just give me what you would give me now so I can just go live my own life the way I want to live it. You see, the younger son has some expectations on what life is all about. He has some expectations of what's going to bring him joy. He has some expectations of what's going to bring him fulfillment. His father's advice is no longer qualified. His father's advice is no longer adequate for his situation and for his life. He knows what's best for him. And he's going to live life the way he wants to live it and under his rules and his guidelines. But he wants the father's blessing. Not so much as his blessing as in approval, but his blessing as financial stability. His blessing of what his father can give him financially. So father, I wish you were dead. Give me what you would give me so I can go live my life the way I want to live it. And it says that his father agrees. Verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. See, this is what happens when we do things our way when we want it. In a sense, what the son is saying is that he expected, he expected to do things his way, and in doing things his way, he thought that the world 
would give him a sense of joy. He thought that the world would give him a sense of fulfillment in actually doing things his own way, spending the money how he wanted to spend it. His father's advice was no longer good to him. And it says because he didn't work for it, he didn't earn it, he didn't deserve it, he just squandered it. Squandered it. Blew it on wild living. Blew it on alcohol, blew it on drugs, blew it on girls, blew it on parties. It didn't matter. He just blew it. He squandered it in wild living. Whether it was gambling it away or whether it was just living the life up as he wanted to do for so long. I don't know how many weeks he was able to survive on it. It doesn't say how many months. Maybe it was even years. But he was living the way that he wanted to, no longer under the Father's guidance, protection, and then trouble set in. It says there, there was a famine in the land. You see, he wasn't planning ahead of time. He, he didn't have his, his finances secure. He didn't invest it properly. He didn't put it in a, a IRA, he didn't put a 401k, he didn't put it in a bank account. He just received it and he blew it. Just thinking that there was going to be more somewhere down the road. But then when trouble set in, it says he began to be in need. And when he began to be in need, when there was a famine in the land, you see, here's the thing about life. Is there's always going to be trouble. There's always going to be a valley. To every mountaintop experience, there's going to be a valley that you go through. To every single time there's a high in life, there's going to be a low. Every single time that you do things and say, you know what, I'm at peace, I'm, at, I'm good, I'm, I'm, I'm there, there's going to sometimes be trouble and anxiety and worry along with it. You see, for every time of blessing, you're also going to go through storms where it feels like you're being cursed. Jesus did not tell us that we're not going to have trouble in this world or on this earth. Jesus did not say that because you're a Christian, there's always going to be a mountaintop experience. Because you're a believer in Christ, because you're a follower in Christ, that you're not going to experience any Trouble. In fact, he told us the very opposite. He said, in life, there's going to be storms. In life, there's going to be problems. In life, there's going to be trouble. What do you do when you're in the midst of trouble? What do you do when you're in the midst of the storm? He gives us a way out of it. He gives us peace through it. He gives us himself to walk with him in it. But he never says that you're going to go around it. You're going to go above it. You have to still go through it. He tells us this because we live in a sinful, broken world of sin. And so there's sometimes things happen that are not our fault. There's sometimes things happen that have nothing to do with us. And it says that there was a famine in the land. Now, did the sun produce the famine? No, the sun didn't produce the famine. It just happened. But because the sun was not prepared for it, he was not expecting it. And he just blew his money however he wanted. Then suddenly he was in need. We can say that maybe this is at the point where he hit rock bottom. This is at the point where he started to have the regrets. This is at the point where he started to think, man, should I have spent it the way I spent it? Should I lived all those years the way that I was living? Should I have done all those things that I was doing? And here's where it comes to maybe a point of, the beginning of the journey of repentance. When in verse 15 it says, So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country. He sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. It's amazing how we don't seem to miss something or appreciate something until we no longer have it. It's amazing how it's not until we no longer have it that suddenly it becomes important and we value it. 
You see, I think this story commutes, communicates so much to us because it wasn't until the son had realized that the money was gone that he began to think, oh, should I have spent it the way I spent it? Should I have just blown it the way I blew it? Should I have squandered it the way I squandered it? Because he missed it when he began to be in need. And he looked around and nobody would help him out. See, the true meaning of Christmas isn't about the lights, isn't about the tree, isn't about the presents or the gift, even though it's so cool to give and receive. But we can be so caught up on purchasing the right present, on getting the right tree, on getting the lights and the decorations that we lose the meaning of Christmas. We thought one thing would bring us happiness and we pursued it for all it was worth. And at the end of the day, we say, is this really what it's all about? I was reading a Facebook post of one of my friends and what they had said in it was, next year I am not doing all of the gifts because... It feels like in preparing all the gifts and buying all the gifts and, and fighting with everybody to get the right gift and trying to make sure that, per, that the Christmas for my family is absolutely perfect, it feels like I'm losing the meaning of what it's all about. Isn't that the case that we can get distracted at all the details? Somebody put in a post yesterday after practice saying, Guys, I know there's some technical difficulties because some of the videos weren't working. And you even probably saw as they were trying to get the mics just right, there was this feedback at times that we can often get distracted with the details and lose the meaning of what it's all about. Right? And Christmas isn't about the details. Christmas story is about God coming down into this earth as a child and taking on flesh. The one who is the creator of all things taking on flesh and being born who say, I want to be with my people. I want to show my people how much I love them and care for them. That's the meaning of Christmas. Christmas is about Jesus. Amen? Christmas isn't about anything else. And we try to have all these expectations. We got to have the right food. We got to have the right pie. We got to have the right cake. We got to have the right turkey, the ham, everything. And we try to do it. And that's all nice. But if we get so busy that we lose what the meaning is really about Jesus, the baby being born into this world to communicate to us that God loves you so much. That he didn't distance himself from sin. He didn't distance himself from that which was broken. When something's broken, we often throw it in the trash. God said, I'm going to step into it and piece it back together. I'm going to heal it. I'm going to fix it. I value it. I love it. And he steps into this world, and that's what the season is really about, is about Jesus choosing to do life with his broken creation. But the younger son had different expectations. The younger son decided to throw away everything the father had given him him, to do life on his own. You see, God never wanted you to do life alone. He never wanted you to do life on your own. That's why... God with us is what the season is all about. Jesus taking on flesh as a human to do life with his people. God does not want you to be alone during the holiday season. He never meant for you to be on your own. He meant for you to be in group and in community. And that's why he gives us the church. For brothers and sisters in Christ to come together. Amen. So we can do life with one another. I got a good friend who calls me that I grew up with, and he's like, I feel so alone. And I'm like, it's because you're not in a good church. You don't have influences. He's not in church at all. That's what I mean. And he's he believes in God, but he doesn't have Christian community around him. There's something of value behind that. 
This younger son wanted to do life on his own. He said, family, forget you. I'm out of here. I'm going to do life by myself. And anybody who's taken that trip, and we all have, we've all chosen to take that trip to say, I'm not going to listen to the wisdom of my parents. I'm not going to use the wisdom of this Bible. I'm not going to use the wisdom of God. I want to do my own thing, God. And I have an expectation that it's going to be better for me. I have an expectation that if I am the captain of this ship, if I navigate my own waters, it's going to turn out well for me. And it gets tiring, it gets exhausting, and we end up alone. And we look around at the different people and we say, why is it that they have so much joy? Why is it that they have so much contentment? Why is it that in the midst of a storm they can walk into church and they can say hallelujah, praise God, still with a smile on their face? And we look around and we say, why is that? And it's because, it's because they have community, they have God, and they understand that God is with us. You see, we have this expectation that things will be better off when we do things ourselves. And the young son looked around and he said, I wish I had what those other people had. I wish that I could have what the pigs were eating. And we see these other believers and we want it. This is what it's meant for us to be. As Christians, we go into the world as a light. We go as a light to the darkness. And people will long to see that light. They will long to see us shining. They will long to see us content and happy. And they'll be like, I want some of that. Because they're feeling lonely and broken and miserable. And they're like, why is it when the storm hits you in life, it seems like you're still okay? Can you tell me your secret? And the secret is a relationship with Jesus. It says in verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And I'm here starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and stay to him. say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. You see, he had his expectation of what his father, how he was going to respond. He had his expectation of how his father was going to treat him. And I'm telling you this because there's so many people in this world who have their viewpoint of God, of an expectation of God. If they come into this church, I'm going to get struck by lightning, they tell me. If I come into this church, the whole church is going to be set on fire. You don't understand what I've done. You don't understand how I've sinned. And we have this expectation, this viewpoint that if we go before God, that God is going to judge us, which fully we do deserve. And that's what the, the mindset of the younger son was thinking. Sometimes we have this, this genie mentality of God that we, we start to think that, you know what, God, I'll pull you out when I need you. I'll pull you out exactly when I need you to answer one of my prayers. And we start to think, you know, we do life on our own the way we want to do it, when we want to do it. But when we need a prayer request, when we need something from God, then it's okay to pull God out and we'll start to pray to him again. And once things are good, we just tuck them right back in the drawer. We just tuck them right back in our wallet and we ignore them. We live the way we want to live it. That was the view of the younger son. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Some of us have teenagers like that, amen? And some of us as parents can even hold it over the teenager. Teenager comes back and apologizes. Well, I told you so. I told you you shouldn't have done that. I knew best for you. And we'll hold it over. Because our parents held it over to us. But I, and that's our viewpoint of God. If we go back to God, he's going he's gonna to hold it over us. If we go back before God, he's going to continue to throw it in our face exactly what we did. And what I want you to see from this story is that our expectation is not always the same as what God does. Look at what he does in the story as he goes back to this, his father. Verse Number 20 said, so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. 
The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And this is where the father says, you're right. I told you not to go off. You wasted my money. Now go be a servant and feed the pigs. It doesn't say that. Look at what it says in verse 21. As the son tells him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. You see, God is not interested in in what you did. God is not interested in the sins that you've committed in your past. What he's interested in is a relationship with you. You know how I know that? Because there was two sons. There was two sons in the story. See, you often hear this preached as this was the lost son and he came back home. But I want to show you that there were two sons to the story and two of them have expectations and two of them are lost. The younger son has the expectation that because he did what he did, the father's no longer going to receive him and accept him. The younger son has this expectation that life is going to be better if he lives for himself and makes his own choices. And he goes off and he lives for himself and he learns that outside of God's house, outside of God's camp, outside of God's way, will only leave you alone and miserable. See, he was looking for everything in the world to fulfill his needs. The same way we do today. We look for people to fulfill our needs. We look for sinful pleasures to fulfill our needs. We look for money to fulfill our needs. We look for all of these things to fulfill our needs, but once you receive it, you're still left empty and lonely and feeling, why isn't this fulfilling our need? And it's because only a relationship with God can really fill the hole that you have in your heart that sin put there. It's only a relationship with God that can give you the joy and contentment that you're looking for. It's only a relationship with God where you feel like God is walking with you through the valleys that brings you a sense of peace. It's only a relationship with God that puts you back at the mountaintop because as you seek everything else in this world, it's called idol worship. When we replace the creation with the creator. That's what the son did. He said, I'd rather have the money than the one who provides the money. I'd rather have the inheritance than the one who saved up the inheritance. I would have, rather have a relationship with the creation instead of the creator. But it's a relationship with the creator that gives us everything that we've been looking for. We try to fill this hole in our hearts with other things, part of the creation. It's the same thing Adam and Eve did. I want to look at a piece of that fruit. I want to be like God. I want to do life on my own and have the knowledge and the ability of God. And they sought after to be exactly like God because they rather have the creation than the creator. That's the sin that we all commit. All of us have done that. But there was a second brother. Look at what it says. It says in verse 25, meanwhile, the older brother was in the field. When he became, came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back in safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, pleaded with him. In verse 29, but he answered his father, look. All these years, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. He's jealous. He's so jealous of his brother. And you know what? All of us can probably see it in the situation too. If we had been obedient, And our younger brother had gone off and squandered our inheritance, part of the family, and spit in our father's face. We would probably be upset too. Why is the father so forgiving? The older brother's not. Verse 31, he says, My son, the father said, You are always with me, 
and everything I have is yours. I, I, I have to read that verse to you again because if you don't take anything else from this morning, you need to take this home with you. In verse 31, he says, My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. You see, I think this is the meaning behind all of Luke 15 right here, is that there were two sons, and neither of them were having their expectations met. The first son wasn't happy with his dad's rule, and his expectations was, if I live my world in my life, and if I live my life the way I want, then I'm going to meet my own expectations. And he ended up empty. But the older son had an expectation that the father was going to do the things his way. He had an expectation that life is going to turn out. If I'm obedient to you, God, then you're going to just shower all the blessings down on me. If I'm obedient and do things your way, Lord, then everything's always going to turn out the way that I want it to turn out. We have this expectation that A plus B equals C. And God, you're going to fit in my box and do things my way. And the older brother said, you know what? This is the way it should be. The younger son, you went out and squandered it. He comes back home. You should make him a servant, and he should have to serve you. You've never given me a single goat. You've never given me anything to be able to party with my friends. And I've always been obedient to you. I've always followed your rules. Why are you allowing things to happen to me the way that you're allowing them to happen? We have this expectation of God that if we're obedient, then God's going to do what we want him to do. Like kind of a, a genie in a bottle. That God, you give me my wishes, I'll follow you if, right? That's what we do. God, if you do this for me, then I will do this for you. I will commit my life for you if you do this for me. We always have this if clause. That's the mentality of the older brother. You're going to do it my way if. And he has this expectation that because he's doing things the right way, then his father's going to respond to him. But see, they both miss the point because the father says, you've always been with me. We've always been in relationship with one another. Everything I have is yours. My house that we sleep in together is yours. The animals that we take care of together is yours. You've been walking around thinking that because you're feeding the animals, because you're doing this, that you're being blessed. I want to tell you you're being blessed not because of what you do, but it's because I love you. I I don't think you understood me this morning. God doesn't say, I'm going to have a relationship with you because you're a good person. God doesn't say, I'm going to enter into this world during this Christmas season and do life with you because you do everything that I want you to do. God says, I bless you because I love you. It's not based on what you do. It's actually based on what you've done in the past. If we actually got what we deserved, then we wouldn't receive any blessing at all but God says I want to bless you because I want to have a relationship with you everything I have is already yours the houses that you sleep in the cars that you drive the food that you eat I bless you because I love you that's the meaning behind it not based on what you've done whether you're the younger brother Or the older brother. Whether you've made mistakes in your life. And you feel like you don't deserve. God's blessing. Or whether you've been trying to earn God's blessing this entire time. Looking for him to shower down and rain on you. Because of your obedience to him. We don't earn our salvation. We don't work for our salvation. We don't get our salvation based off the things we've done. We earn. We get our salvation based off. The gift of salvation is based off what he has done for us. That Jesus lived a perfect life in order to die on our behalf of what we deserve to die. In order for us to receive the gift that he deserved. See, that's what Christmas is all about. God coming into this world to say, I love you. I want a relationship with you. If you've been living like the younger brother, doing things your own way, 
and wondering if God's judging you, I want you to hear this morning that God wants a relationship with you, that God loves you. He comes into this world during Christmas to show you how much he loves you. And you go back to him wondering, God, all I need is want, want you to feed me some food. All I do is want you to provide for my needs. And the father says, no, you're not going to just be one of my servants so I can provide for your needs. Bring the, the ring, put him on their finger, showing that we're married together. Put the robe on, showing that you're worthy and you have value to me. And he calls him his son, not a servant, to show that you are adopted son and daughter of Christ. This is Jesus telling the people how God wants to have a relationship with those who are lost. In order for them to be found, they rejoice. And then he goes to the older brother who's still looking to earn salvation, who's still looking to earn approval. Everything I do and you don't reign and celebrate with me. And the father's saying, you're missing the point. You're thinking that all of these things are because you're a good person, you're a good boy. No, it's not. It's because I love you. It's because I care for you. A father wants to have a relationship with their child. God wants to have a relationship with you this Christmas season. And whether you're the younger son and you've gone your own way or you're the older one still trying to earn the blessings from God, he says enough is enough. I've already given you the opportunity to have a relationship. Everything I have is yours. I'm going to ask as we close for you to bow your heads. Because I know that there's probably some people in here who are still wondering if God loves them. You've been thinking of some of your past regrets. And you're feeling right now that feeling like the younger son when he was feeding the pigs. If only God would. If only God would welcome me back. Why did I do what I did? I have this feeling of guilt and shame walking around. And I want you to shed that this morning to know that God's not interested in your guilt or shame. He's not interested in your past action. He's not interested in your regret. God is interested in a relationship with you. He wants to wrap his arms around you. He's been waiting for you to come here this morning to receive him. He's been looking and waiting by the door for your return. And for those who have wandered away and done their own thing, God wants to embrace you and have a relationship with you this Christmas season. He wants to wrap his arms around you. And for those who are still the older brother thinking that, God, if I just do this, then he'll, you'll, you'll give me this. If I just am obedient, if I just pray enough, if I just read my Bible enough, if I just do this, then God might, God might, God might. And God says, no, I do it because I love you. Everything I have is already yours. Everything I have, all you do is need to understand that it's about relationship this morning. And if you want a relationship with Jesus, he offers it to you as a free gift. He says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so if you want to receive the gift of God, Christ Jesus, as your Lord and Savior this morning, all you do is have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And in Romans, it says you will be saved. That's it. It's eternal life. It's a relationship with God. And if that's you this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody's looking, would you just let God know? Would you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart? Would you just put your hand up in the air so I can pray for you this morning? Would you just let God know? Amen. Amen. And I just want you to pray this prayer with me. Some of you can just pray in your head. You don't got to pray in your house. Father God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I don't deserve your grace. But Father, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I want to have a relationship with you. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I want to commit my life to follow you 
the rest of the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you've prayed that prayer before ever in your life or you prayed that today, let me tell you, the same way that the father throws a party for his son is the same way that angels are rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who commits their life to Jesus. Christmas is a celebration. Christmas is a party. It's a party that Jesus came into this world. It's a celebration that the baby is born, Emmanuel, that says God with us. And so do not lose everything in the expectation. Do not lose the true meaning of Christmas. I want to ask you to stand to your feet this morning as I send you away with God's blessing. As you go pick up your kids over in Power Kids, don't forget to take a photo at the kiosk this morning with your family. Don't forget to enjoy your family. Maybe you need to call the person who you haven't talked to in a while to remember that Christmas is all about relationships. I want to send you away with God's blessing that he wants to have a relationship with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his amazing peace. Amen? Amen. Go in peace. Have a great Sunday.